everybody. You are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. And did she get any alimony or a settlement in her divorce? Very little. She got out of the marriage. Done. Did she have legal representation? Unfortunately, Kimberly, I'm so glad you said that. Some lawyers don't suggest that a financial plan be done so that people know what they really can afford. And in this case, she just wanted to get out of the marriage. Right. She was done. And I think women do that to their detriment. I have many stories of women, brilliant lawyers, who I said, you can't get out of that marriage without being clear about what you should get because they just want to leave because they can make money and that's, they just want out. But that's very short-sighted. Very short-sighted. We can't do that. We've got to inspire everyone before you make any decisions to have a plan and to do a plan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fiscal Feminist podcast. Today is going to be a really, really deep dive conversation with my guest, Deborah Schatzky, who is very similar to me because she is also a wealth manager and financial advisor. I really was taken by Deborah's bio and what she's been up to. I think she's a soul sister in many ways because we both care desperately about women and about women progressing financially and about women in the career arena and so on and so forth. We both have talked at length about the fact that, you know, given our gender pay gap of 82 cents on the dollar, maybe it's 83 cents at this point, I don't know, but it will take 130 some years for us to level the playing field. So we need to keep banging the drum and she and I are going to keep doing that together. So Deborah, let me give you a little background before I introduce her. She's uh, been a professional in the wealth management business for more than 30 years, even though she looks like she's about 25. She started when she was in college helping her mom and working to create pension plans, which I think is kind of awesome. I'm not sure I even knew what a pension plan was when I was in college. Uh, In 1997, then she created what I love this concept, financial services in a box, which was a financial planning model that she licensed to accounting firms. So, you know, a lot of uh, accounting firms and advisors do financial plans and you need to have a program to do that. And then she was also running the financial services and investment advisory arm of those accounting firms. So she has a lot of background, a lot of uh, depth. Uh, In 2010, she started her own registered investment advisory company It's called BPP Wealth Solutions, and it's in New Jersey, in not Princeton, but Baskerville. Baskin Ridge. Baskin Ridge. And that stands for Build, Protect, and Preserve. So those are three words I like a lot. She also has just written a book called Chaos to Joy. You can buy that on Amazon, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the podcast. So Deborah, welcome. Thank you for coming to join me today to talk about some of these really important topics concerning women in the financial advisory business and in just their journey in general. Oh, it's such a privilege. And congratulations to you, one of the top rated women in our business. I love that. Oh, thank you so much. I can't believe it myself. I'm honored to be have been chosen for that. So thank you for recognizing that. I appreciate that. So you have just done so much. And I just think I want to start with... I think your reputation and your experience speaks for itself. You're very, very successful. You've done very well. Let's start with why did you write a book? What was the reason for writing the book, Chaos to Joy? Because that's where you currently are. You just released it. You just had a book party in Aspen. So that's where your head is at. So I want to start with the book because Chaos to Joy is very much in your wheelhouse of helping people. So tell me a little bit about how you your journey took you to the point of writing this book? Well, I first want to say, like you, I am a warrior for women. And I will do what it takes to help women find their voice and understand what's needed to be done. And that's what Chaos to Joy is about. Chaos to Joy are five fabulous women that really were in horrible situations And without the help of professionals to guide them through it and direct them on what was important to them, what their ultimate goals were in 
getting out of the situations and working together with professionals to get out of those situations, it wouldn't have happened. It would have been chaos to disaster. Right. Um, every single one of them had a really bad story. And I wanted to write a book where it wasn't me just talking about finance, but I really wanted the clients to be able to have their words and so it's an interview between me and the client, kind of like a Tuesday with Moray, mm-hmm. where it's an interview where I lay the groundwork on what the facts were and how these clients came in. And then each one was interviewed. And the story goes back and forth on how we work together to get it from chaos and really disaster to joy. And it was just a privilege to interview these women. They were one fabulous lady after another. So what, you know, I think women have had, and, you know, the narrative for women has been a lot different than the narrative for men, just because of the historical evolution of our rights and and how things have kind of come about over the years. And we face a lot of different barriers. And I know for the you, you and I, we... We are in the financial services business, but there are only 24% in 2022 of professional wealth managers or financial advisors were women. So that's only a quarter, a little bit less than a quarter of women representing in this field when there are so many women now who are, you know, breadwinners who do have assets and they are not going to have as many women advisors to really help them because there's such a paucity of it of, you know, women hanging around in this business and and actually trying to put their mind to it. You kind of got very involved in this early on. Obviously, your mom was kind of in this space with the pension plans. So that's how you came into it. But through your experience, not only with your clients, but just in general as an advisor, why do you think that we, we don't have more women in this space? What are our barriers? What's causing women to not kind of make the move into this space? I think it's really because of how the business is set up. And I've been fighting with chairmen of many companies about this for years. And I said chairmen because that's what it's been. Right. You know, women need regular cash flow. And a lot of this business is set up where you don't have any money or not enough money to pay your bills in the beginning. Right. And I don't understand the model. I mean, on the insurance side, the model is that you – Don't give them really much. You give them a stipend and it's, you know, you get paid on what you sell, you know, and on the investment side, you know, you get uh, an income, but it's not enough to pay your bills. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to convince people to change. I mean, I have a firm of all women, everyone Mm -hmm. On my in my consulting firm as a woman. Now, it wasn't designed that way, but that's how it is. And in all those situations, every single one of my women employees makes a living that they can afford to live. So that's a really important thing, what you're doing. I mean, I don't think people really, because this is a really, it's like a dark art, you know, people don't really know how this whole thing works. And um I started at Morgan Stanley in the financial advisory program, right? So the wirehouses have these big, a wirehouse is a big kind of investment bank that also has a, you know, financial advisory wealth management kind of arm to it or a big bank. And um, they all have training programs, so to speak. And you go in and they basically tell you that the success rate is literally like 2%. Right. Because you you go through a three-year program and you start off making not a lot of money. I think I started off 11 or 12 years ago and I was making, and I had been a lawyer and I, yeah, I had a bit of a break in my career when I lived in London. So I was doing other things, not in the capital markets, but I think I started off making like $60,000 a year. And I had a boatload of experience, right? Like they were like, we don't care. You have to prove yourself. So I go into the program and at Morgan Stanley, if you didn't pass the Series 7 test within the first month, then you lost your job. You had That's one, right. it was a one-shot deal. I think Merrill Lynch gave you two, but Morgan Stanley, you had one opportunity to pass this test. If you didn't pass it the next day, you were out. And so there is the first problem. And then after that, you had to pass your, I had to pass my Series 66. But then I got into what they call production, right? It gone through the little, the program, the studies, the, you know, all the things they make you do, which was good. Uh, and then you go into what they call production and it's like, okay, you have three months to get going. 
And then every quarter, we're going to review where you're at. And if you haven't hit certain targets, your pay starts going down by 5%, 10%. So I I guess it's some sort of weird motivational scare tactic, because obviously we don't want to starve. But that's why maybe they start off with a class of 2,000 people. And three years later, there's like four people left nationally, you know. They make it designed for you kind of not to be successful, at least in that environment. Um, Luckily for me, I was able to segue and get hired by the Bonson Group, which at the time wasn't Morgan Stanley. Now we're an independent advisory group and I'm managing director and partner in it. But I was a lawyer for many years and a tax person. So I then segued into becoming the director of financial planning as well as an advisor. So I was able to then get a salary and kind of have the cash flow that you're talking about because I still had three kids that I was supporting at the time, two in high school, one had just started college and I was just coming out of a terrible divorce where I didn't get very much. So that was my saving grace. But when you talk to people, how receptive are they about this idea? You know, the the chairman of big companies or not, I have not had a breakthrough yet on that. I'm hoping that the more we talk about it, the more it will start to be a thing that they want to change. Um, because you you really can't have a successful, I don't think you can have a successful financial services business without paying people well. And I, and I think it really makes a difference. I mean, that is really important. And the, when I say well, I mean, the system was really set up so that you eat what you kill. Right. And if we're really on a team wouldn't you want the company to be working on clients as a team and then really give, you know, if the most important thing I think is our clients and our team, it's the front of the hand and the back of the hand. And if we can really allow our team to take care of our clients, then we can, those of us that are really good at bringing in business can then go out and bring in more business because we have a team right. to be able to service them. It's a different model than I'm just going to go out and I'm going to eat what I kill and that's how I'm going to run my business and everything's going to go down the silo. No, I'm saying let's not have that be the answer. Let's have a business where we're hiring competent people, paying them a good wage and providing them with incentives by helping to grow the business and service our clients so that we can all move up together. And let me ask you a question because this is something I think about a lot. I have a feeling that women-owned advisory businesses are different than the, yep. the, you know, the regular advisory gig. I'll be honest, we at the Bonson Group... I am the only woman financial advisor. And then we have one other lady, uh, Sarah Leitsky, who's our risk management director. But, you know, the rest of the women employed are in operations and they're probably more important than I am because without Beth, who's my operations lady and assistant, she, you know, I'd be so screwed. Um, so Beth is really right. the brains behind the organization with me. But um, the reality is, is that it's a very male dominated environment. And I think things are thought of in a very male way. For example, the topic of remote working. I am lucky as a managing part, a managing director, a partner who has my own PL, I can pretty much do whatever I want in that regard. I do try to go into the office as much as I can, but I also work remotely and I master my own universe. But the other employees are not so much in that vein as I am. They have there are more restrictions about showing up at the office. What is your take for women as the owner of a business? It's an all woman business, which I mean, I'm applauding you on every level for that. What is your take on that? Because I think with childcare and all of the other things that women are dealing with, because women are multifaceted people with many, many responsibilities. They just, they don't often have someone at home doing their grocery shopping, picking up their dry cleaning, Uh, making sure the kids are picked up from school, all those little things that kind of eat away at our time and our, you know, our resources. How are you dealing with time 
for your employees if they need that parental time? Well, it's actually interesting. I, I also had a hard time in the beginning. And before COVID, we got lucky. And I say we got lucky because we had a flood in our office. And it turned out that there was black mold. So we had to set ourselves up to be remote, completely remote, Mm -hmm. um, because we weren't allowed in the office for six weeks. Amazing that that literally happened about three months before COVID. So we were all set up working at home. I mean, it just, you know, God works in mysterious ways. That was just incredible. So when COVID hit, we were ready. We were 100% able to work at home. And it was so transformative for me because you know I grew up in this business like you said my mom who started in the business when she was in her 30s and was the first woman to be man of the year you know it was normal customary to go into the office every day that's what you did and then all of a sudden things you know 9/11 changed that because you know that was the first opportunity we had to start working remotely and then other things, and then COVID really took it over the top. You know, it. I find that working at home is great. I find that not only were we much more efficient during COVID, and we doubled our business during COVID because of that. Very good. Because we were on the phone and on the Zooms with anybody who needed help. If they were related to some of our clients, if they were, our cli- you know, obviously. Yeah, and geographically, they could be anywhere. It didn't matter anymore. It opened up the whole universe. So, so the great thing about the Internet and Zoom and what we're doing right now is that there is no reason that you do have to go in every day. Now, that being said, I do find that there is an energy. Yeah, there's a synergy. Exactly. That happens when you are together. And we do go in twice a week. We go in on Mondays and Wednesdays mostly. And I think that's reasonable. I like that idea. I mean, two to three days a week. That's kind of what I shoot for, three days a week. I really love going into the office. I do because first of all, I you know, I get the energy from my colleagues and then if I'm trying to work on something particular, I often have like working with my analysts if I'm trying to, you know, I'm a- often talking to people with, you know, high ultra high net worth people. These are complicated things that we're trying to accomplish or do for them. So it's helpful to do that while I'm in the office and I'm interfacing with those guys, you know. But I think a compromise is what I like. And I think that there's no shaming. It's like, we're going to do some at home and some in the office. And I feel maybe women are a little, women um, CEOs or women managers might be a little more amenable to that than you've got to come in five days a week and I don't want to hear it, you know, because it is very difficult. So were you a working mother? Yeah. So working mom, unfortunately, at that point, when Will was young, he's now a senior in high school. I was driving, well, we lived in the city, New York City, right. but I was going into the office every day because I was running accounting firm, wealth management, family office, and investment advisory divisions at that time. And they were large accounting firms. And the difference was, is I was going in every day and I was working really hard. However, I controlled my schedule. So mm-hmm. as you, because I was a managing director and they were using, the accounting firms were using my, they were licensing my process that I created. So I I had a lot more flexibility, which is a shame in some ways, but you know, I would take Will to school and I would be able to go to different things. So I, even though I did go into the office daily, I did have the flexibility of being there for important events. And I made my whole team have that flexibility. I mean, I think that there's so much more value when we allow our employees to actually have the freedom of being there for milestones and being really part of their families and have a balanced life. It's critical. Um, and then when I you know, created my own consulting firm um, in 2010, I, we don't have to go into the office. Like I said, two days a week, I think is fine. And there were time, I had my hips replaced last year. I didn't go into the office for three months. And yeah. you know what? We did great. Yeah. And I think this is, I often say this, and I say this in my book that I wrote, 
For those of you who don't know what the book is, because you haven't listened before, it's called The Fiscal Feminist, A Financial Wake-Up Call for Women. But I talk about being intentional with your career choices, but also with where you work. So don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, how do things go here uh, with remote work? How do things go with, you know, people who are caregivers? Are they walking the walk and talking the talk? And I I also think that for women, they may have a more sympathetic environment if they work in an all-woman or a woman-run environment of business. So just to take away on that is if you are a younger person and you're interviewing and you're looking for jobs, you know, go on Glassdoor, go ask the HR people, find out everything. Don't go in there and not ask questions because it compensation is definitely important in how you increase your compensation and what your job title and roles are. But as equally important is something like this because this affects your balance in your life and your overall happiness. So I do think women do a better job of that because they have themselves had to do it. Uh, your mom obviously was a rock star, man of the year. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And um you know, because she was ahead of her time, right? Yeah, that's what the award was. It wasn't like they, you know, that's what they changed it after that. It was representative yeah. after that. That's awesome. Uh, so, okay, so you, you've you made a successful wealth management business and you're you're trying to change the world by helping women. So you in this book, Chaos to Joy, you've got these five or six kind of case studies, we'll call them. And right. what was the one that you found was most compelling, if you could share that with us? So, you know, I want people to come away from this and take some nuggets away to say, well, if I'm in this situation, I should be thinking about X, Y, and Z. And again, as women, we have so many different things that go on, whether it's career interruption whether we have a gray divorce, which can be a really, really bad for a lot of women in their 50s and 60s who then are living in a very, you know, reduced lifestyle in their, in their retirement. And, and it's, it's a very big deal. Or, you know, there's so many different things. Uh, also, in the way we invest, sometimes I think women tend to want to keep cash more than they should. So we have our very specific characteristics and lifestyles that need to be addressed in a more, you know, specific way. So tell us a couple of examples of the case studies in your book that really highlight what some pe- some women are up against and what you suggested to do to fix it. Well, the first one, which was really simple, was, um, and the person, this person was the inspiration behind the book. She was the one that said, you should just interview a bunch of your women clients and make a book out of it because without professional help, the the chaos would have turned to disaster, not joy. Um, so the first one was really simple. Divorced mom of two uh, moves, you know, to the East Coast from the Midwest. And, and how old was she? She was 40s, in her 40s. Okay. Late 40s. And um, she worked for a very prestigious firm. She thought she was making good living, but... One of her best friends told her to call us. We, I did her plan, and I told her that she wouldn't be able to pay for her. She couldn't pay her overhead living on the East Coast with what she was making, and she needed to ask for a fifty thousand dollars raise. And did she get any alimony or a settlement in her divorce? Or Mm-mm, very little because of her job. Very little. She got out of the marriage. Done. Yep. Did she have legal representation, or did? How did that work? Unfortunately, Kimberly, I'm so glad you said that. People don't do their financial plan or some lawyers don't suggest that a financial plan be done so that people know what they really can afford. And in this case, she just wanted to get out of the marriage. She was right. It was she was done. And I think women do that to their detriment. I have many stories of women, brilliant lawyers who I said, you can't get out of that marriage without being clear about what you should get because they just want to leave because they can make right. money and that's they just want out. But that's very short-sighted. Very short-sighted. We can't do that. We've got to inspire everyone before you make any decisions to have a plan and to do a plan. When you are getting divorced, I mean, I have a CDFA, um, which is I'm a certified divorce financial analyst, but there are a lot of great CDFAs out there 
And I'm going to also be doing a podcast uh, with a forensic accountant in the upcoming future, which I think is going to be really interesting because they play a big role in big divorces role. where things are not really transparent and people don't respond to subpoenas and blah, blah, blah. But I do think that when with Lee and look, I've been a lawyer too, so I have had worn many hats, but I think lawyers sometimes don't look at the real financial aspects of splitting up assets the way they sometimes suggest. I had somebody reach out to me the other day who's a six-year-old woman getting divorced, four kids, hasn't worked since she was, I don't know, like 20-something. And the split that was being recommended by, well, suggested by her husband and the lawyer representing her wasn't really pushing back on it, was so disadvantageous to her. She was going to be stuck with like some sort of real estate that had a lot of problems. It wasn't, you know, the husband wanted to keep the family home. There were all these things and I was like, wow, you know, this is what, it has a trickle down effect in your life. So you can't cut and run. Um, You really need to do almost pre telling anyone you want a divorce, you got to do a financial plan, have that in place, and then say you want to have a divorce. A hundred percent. Kimberly, let everybody hear that. I mean, that is the best way to do anything. I mean, first of all, everybody should have a financial plan. We live in a country. To begin with, yeah. Get them. So, you know, there's such an unbelievable difference in your life when you measure what matters. For sure. Ignorance is not an option. Knowledge is power. And financial planning should drive how you invest, when you retire. You know, I have these conversations every day. You know, I was speaking to someone yesterday, two people in their early 60s own a company, but their son's going to take it over and they want to retire in the next couple of years. And I'm like, well, let's, let's do the planning now because they're just new clients because we'll see what that looks like. It may be you can do it and live the life you want, but maybe, and this happens a lot with doctors. They always say, I want to retire. They get burnt out. And then they look at the plan and they're like, well, I can't keep up my 400,000 or $500,000 a year in expenses unless I work part-time for another four or five years. And the plan lets you know that. And so, I mean, I'm, as we're sitting here think, you know, talking about this, I'm thinking, I want to come up with a financial plan for pre-divorce strategy. I talk a lot about pre-divorce strategy, but I think this would be a really good thing for people to have. Well, we have, I'll give you my plan. I mean, our security income plan is so easy and so on the money because it's exactly what you're talking about, security income planning. You know, I found when I was running the accounting firms for years that no matter how wealthy or not somebody was, that when they really understood the their income and mm-hmm, their mm-hmm. once they understood their income and the vulnerability of that income, that yeah. it was really a different conversation. And some women and, don't even have income in their after their divorce because they haven't worked for a while. And it, if they're in their sixties, they may they may get a job. But I was just reading in the Wall Street Journal the other day, a lot of people in their fifties who get kind of put into early retirement a large percentage of them never find jobs again. Never. I'm seeing it with a couple of clients that, that um, have been on Wall Street forever and they are they were major players and they can't get a job and, and all they want to do is work and they're in their late 50s or early 60s and nobody can hire them. Um, some of them have created consulting firms, but yeah. others, you know, don't have the ability to or the connections to do that. It really is amazing. But security income plan, you know, I designed security income plan because of the risk that people have not understanding their plans. Yeah, everybody needs to understand. where. And I always say to people who aren't my clients, just out in the great wide world, if there's only two things you know, want to know or you can get your head around is just how much you make and how much you spend. That will tell you a lot about yourself because if at the end of the month you are spending more than you make, then it means you've got a lot of credit card debt. And then that takes us down a whole other topic. But so, okay, so this gal, she's wanted out, she got out and she wanted just want to get the heck out of Dodge and she did. She got an amazing job for a dream company, her dream company. Okay. And her salary would be sufficient to pay the bills. And she had two kids, you know, going into college. And she was wrong. She needed $50,000 more. Okay, so she got a new job. She moved to New York from the Midwest. So now she's like really changed her life. 
kids are going to college and as a, a divorced woman who had her kids in college, um, I can tell you that's a big, big nut, especially when they're going to like my, you know, my kids went to like Georgetown and University of Miami and all those kind of places. Yep, her so too. it was expe- very expensive. Yeah. Um, I think I might still be reeling from that, although I've moved on to weddings, which that's another whole other podcast that, you know, I'm still reeling from the wedding last year, which was awesome. Okay. So what did you say to her about, okay, you're brand new in this job. You have all this stuff that's just happened to you. How is she going to get her $50,000? Like, what are you telling her? What does she need to say? So I told her that I I needed her to go ask her boss for a $50,000 raise. Based on what? Based on her need or based on her capabilities? Based on her plan. I did her plan. Had nothing to do with capability. I figured, you know, I figured it was... She had a good shot at getting it. They they really, it, like I said, it's one of the most prestigious companies in the country. They really wanted her. So I had a good feeling about it. And I said to her, listen, you know, you just did your plan. You can just say to your boss, listen, I just did my financial plan moving from the Midwest to New York. It's very different. And bottom line is, is that my financial planner says I need $50,000 more in order to really pay my bills. What's he going to say? He could say yes, no, or I'll give you something different. And I said, but you have to ask. You don't have a choice. I need you to ask. And just out of curiosity, was that a pay rise kind of comparable to someone else in that job doing it somewhere else? Or was it, was she still in the realm of norm, like what people doing her job would get paid? Yes, it was still in the realm. Um, and if she was a man, it probably would have been what she was being paid. Let's be honest. Right. So yes. But, and I knew that. So it was easy for me to, you know, when you do somebody's plan and you see what their cash flow is, this is not, this was not a woman that was going out and, you know. Yeah, she wasn't extravagant. Everyone. Yeah. Not at yeah. all. She was a really unbelievable professional, very decorated in her background, very desirable for this company. And, you know, I thought she was in a good position to get the race, but she was scared out of her wit. She never really did a financial plan, which is why I want everybody to hear this. Do the plan. Once she did the plan and saw it, when she went in to ask for the raise, she at least had the confidence to know that she really needed it. It wasn't something that was just a good idea. And she just wanted to ask for 50,000 more. She needed that. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's the thing to your point, like your advice was good and she acted on it, which I'm sure was very, really scary for her. Cause you know, like, again, we are not trained to ask for things and we always feel like, you know, we have to be perfect and, you know, we have to have all the the stars have to be perfectly aligned and $50,000 sounds like a lot of money. And, you know, I could just imagine all the stuff going through her head, but Coming back to like pre-divorce, you know, when you're planning to do your divorce, you should actually do a financial plan of what the assets are that you think you're going to get or you're going to ask for and the money that you're going to have and the incomings that you're going to have from your own income and then any child support or whatever and do a kind of financial plan based on what you think that's going to look like because that will tell you a lot about how you're going to live post-divorce. Um, and it, it's not going to be the same as pre-divorce. So it could be really shockingly different. So, you know, I think luckily for your client, she had you to help her now, you know, thread that needle. And then, and what you gave her was advice about career negotiation based on a financial plan. Yes, exactly. And what I gave her too was a voice. You know, I think that that's our biggest problem, women more than men, is that we we were not taught how to really talk about money well. We're not as educated yet on how to do plans and why plans are important. We're getting there. I think women are signing up in faster percentages for planning than men at this stage. Yeah, and I think a lot of, I've read that women actually use financial planning more than men do to dictate how they invest, which I think makes a lot of sense. I don't think women are necessarily risk averse. I just think they like to have a little more analysis before they dive in. And I also think, you know, they don't have that whole 
bro thing of like market timing and, oh, did you hear about this stock? I mean, that's so 70s anyway. Who does that? True. But, you know, whatever. I mean, people still do it because I see the Robin Hood commercials. But um, <laughs> anywho, I digress. Okay, so you gave her good advice, which was you got to stick up for yourself and negotiate. And I think it's kind of novel, actually. Maybe you have to be in a certain job, but and it may not be appropriate for all jobs, but having a financial plan that you can share with your boss and say, okay, I'm not living extravagantly, but I do have kids in college and I, I am now a single parent and I, you know, I, I moved to New York City. I think that's an interesting tool to have in your toolbox when you're when you're negotiating maybe for some higher level jobs. Exactly. No, it really does. It was amazing. He gave her the raise immediately. But not only did he give her the raise, it really created this, you know, remember she was new to this area. Yeah. So it really created this relationship now with her boss that he actually had understanding of what she was going through. And I think the more that we actually allow our coworkers to know, you know, what we're our lives about, I think it's better. We can have a lot more compassion for one another in most yes. cases. And we're all very similar. We all have a lot of the same stuff, you know, that we have to deal with. Okay, so tell us one more uh, before we wrap up. Tell us one more story from the book. Well, the second one was, I think, the hardest. And, and I say the hardest because one of my clients sold his companies and it was bought by another bigger, comp- much bigger company. And he was the president and he called me um, one night on a Saturday night, which never happens. Turned out um, the owner of the company died and on Monday when he was going to go into the office, it was going to be owned by the spouse and the mother-in-law. And neither one of them worked in the business or really had any business savvy. And he was really scared and I didn't blame him. <laughs> I mean, it was really awful. Yeah, no, this is not uncommon. No planning, no succession planning, had no, yeah. you know, buy sell agreement in place. I mean, you know, why should we do that? You know, multi billion dollar company, you know, 1500 employees, you know. Oh, so um, I, I told him to have the spouse call me immediately. You know, I didn't care if it was the weekend. And, um, and the reason that I, I told him to have her call me is because I try to get people in the action of doing something. Now, obviously, if she didn't call me, I would have called her. But there's something magical that I find occurs when you take a step towards something that's important mm-hmm. to you. So she called me and I went into the city and met with her in her apartment. It was awful. It was really one of the worst situations I ever had because the husband knew he was going to die. He was buying things like crazy, Lamborghinis, houses, things that they didn't need or want. He was just on such a destructive path, you know, and died within the six months where they said he would. And he didn't even tell his family. Oh, my God. They just thought he was was going through like a midlife crisis or something? Exactly. Was he was fifty and he actually died on his fiftieth birthday. I mean, oh almost my on his fiftieth birthday. So he left a wife and three kids and his mom in um, who just buried her daughter. Um, oh, yeah, in really bad shape. Well, thankfully, because of the planning we do, we got. I, I made her bring absolutely everything in. And we picked up everything and we constructed her financial plan. So I was able to call my client to tell him what kind of salary she needed. Um, In addition to that, we were able to have the mother-in-law who didn't want to own the business. We had three appraisals and we sold the business to the president. You know, that half of the business went to the president and together the president now owned half and the spouse owned the other half. And they started working and they worked together 10 years and it was incredible. It was incredible for both of them. And they sold their company for a fortune to a private equity firm. And did she evolve into being a, like learning how to run the business and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. That's she awesome. Had amazing. She had great instincts. You know, she was a real smart thinker. She listened really well. 
Um, she, you know, she, she didn't have a business background, but she had a human background and her human background. And she was willing to do whatever it took. She didn't care. Go clean up that, go do this, go. She just wanted, she needed something to focus on because her kids were now older too. She wanted right. something to focus on and it really helped her grow up as an individual in, in a magnificent way. And, um, you know, her dream was to work 10 years and then sell the firm. And that's what happened. They worked 10 years and they sold the firm and it wound up fabulous for everybody. But, you know, if it wasn't for the financial planning intervention, that that would have been a disaster because there would have been warfare going on instead of a simple yeah. structure and a plan, because we always come from what do you need you know, what are your goals and your dreams and what do you have and what do you need in order to make it happen? Yeah. And I mean, that's it. That's the basis of a financial plan. And then what are your resources? How are you going to build them? And how are we going to do that in a logical way? So I do think you're an angel. You've helped a lot of women. I love that you have, maybe not by design, but I love that you have an all woman financial advisory business. I, you know, that makes my heart so, so happy. So for anybody out there that wants, I know I'm a financial advisor too, but hey, I'm all about the women. So if you like the idea of an all-woman firm, this is your lady, okay? Deborah Shatsky. She's awesome. But I want to ask you, what are the top three things that you would tell women are the most important things to kind of build their net worth? Because again, we're very different than men in all the things that we have to do. You know, we all know we have all these care responsibilities and career disruptions and blah, 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 blah. And you, you've you lived it. You've walked the walk, you know, all of that. And you have all these clients that you've helped. If there are three pieces of advice that you could give to any woman listening to this and say, if you do these three things, it's going to really put you on a good path to building your net worth and having some independence where you can breathe, not worry too much about, you know, being poor in retirement I know there's no panacea, but there are some guideposts that I think we can all follow. So what what would you say? Three tangible things they can take away from this. Great question. The first is have a plan. I don't care. In this country, you can have a financial plan. You can get one easily. Yeah. And there and just by the way, there are companies that that's all they do is financial that's- planning. You don't need to they are not financial advisors in the sense that They're going to say, okay, now you have to give us money to put in your portfolio. There are companies now, and you can Google them, that just do financial planning. So you can just get a financial plan. You pay a couple thousand bucks and you have a plan. Yeah, and we'll do that. I mean, planning is the core of our business. We will actually do a plan without assuming we're going to get anything else. There are so many firms now that will do a plan. Get a plan. Why you want to have a plan is because the number one thing you want to start doing is you want to start making sure that you can fulfill your dreams. Identify what it is you want in your life. It's amazing how the universe works. You know, whether you believe in it or not, I will tell you in every situation we have designed a plan based on their dreams, not just simple goals, but really big audacious dreams. It's amazing what happens when you start a plan motoring in the direction of really what you want your life to be, how to live your best life. So the first thing is to have a plan. The second thing is to make sure that plan is not just on how to get by, but really how to accomplish your big, you know, dreams. And then the third thing is to make sure you review it regularly. What you measure matters. I said it before. You need to be on top of your most important thing, which is your plan. I think just like your health, you get up, you should exercise. I think Mm -hmm. you should drink a lot of water. You should have a plan. (laughs) I I really do. I I I mean, I I have to say something right now, and this is a, a truth. What you have said here, I think, differentiates you from a lot of other planners or just the planning discussion in general, which can be a little bit, you know, dry. People are like, "Uh, I'd rather, you know, go get my nails done than do a, you know, financial plan. No, no, you would not. And the thing is, is what Deborah's saying about dreams is so important. 
We all have passions and dreams. I hope, I hope you all do. If you don't, then we need to do one on therapy. Uh, We have to have a podcast on therapy about having dreams. But, you know, if you are working towards something that's going to make you super excited, it doesn't have to be a professional dream. It could be a hobby dream. It could be any kind of dream that you really want to accomplish that requires resources. If you have a plan in place where you can see the end goal, like I can actually do this. If I do these things the plan tells me to do, you're going to be so much more excited about it. And I like the spin that you put on this because usually when you talk about financial planning, it's in the, it's in the context of retirement. Right. Often it's for in, in the middle of your life too, if you want to buy a house or you want to have all you know certain things that need to be done. But I've rarely heard it talked about in the sense of doing the plan to accomplish, your, you know, to, to fulfill a dream. Mm-hmm. And that to me is like, it's a magical way to explain this. And I hope it motivates people to understand the importance of really getting, you know, deep into the planning with somebody like Deborah or call Deborah. Speaking of which, how do people reach out to you? How do they find you? Well, the easiest way is our website, which is just uh, B as in build, P as in protect, P as in preserve, uh, wealth.com. Our website, um, there's a sign in. You can, well, people reach out to us all the time. And that's the easiest way to get in touch with us or just service at BPP Wealth, where we'll get an email and we'll jump on it and take care of people. Those are the two best, you know, or you can call us, um, which is 908-442-7750. Now, I think uh, if you're out there and you have something you're trying to accomplish and you just are like, how the heck am I going to get to that end point? A little bit of planning and just figuring out where you're at. I think so many people get overwhelmed by day-to-day life demands that this is just to them like, I just cannot get my head around this. It's just one extra thing I have to do. But that's not right because if you do the planning with a professional who is going to help you not only figure out your plan and your strategy, but help you kind of figure out what your dreams really are and, you know, by just talking about it, then things change. Your life starts to change. It's bigger. It's broader. And it's not just about getting by day to day. It's about, you know, looking at at the end game and saying, oh my God, I actually am excited because I think I'm going to be able to change my life. And that's really powerful. And the other thing that you said that I love, uh, that I'm going to definitely steal, and so you can pull up the mark, there's a financial planning intervention. Mm-hmm. I mean, that could be like a whole TV show. We could do a reality <laughs> TV show on financial planning intervention. I love it. I think we should do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so buy Deborah's book, Chaos to Joy, because there's a lot of case studies in there. I know she has some on her website as well. And I think she's got a lot of very good pointers and advice for, for everyone, but specifically for women to move the ball down the field so that we aren't, you know, we don't want to, we don't want it to take 130 years to even the playing field. And so every woman that can start to even the playing field in her own life will start to shrink that number down. And so we have to do it one woman at a time. We just don't, you know, unfortunately right now the child care tax credit's going away. It's becoming more and more expensive for us to become, uh, to take care of children if we decide to have them. There's inflation at the moment, you know, and, you know, there's things that come up in a life. So if you are organized and you have a plan and you have a professional who is going to be vested in helping you because they really care about you, that is worth its weight in gold for so many reasons. Anything you'd like to close with, Deborah, before we wrap up? I think you're awesome. And I just, I love what you're doing. So give us the, your last pearls of wisdom before we, we wrap this up. The last pearls of wisdom are that dreams matter. We should not stuff them in a closet or not even talk about them. A lot of people say you can't give things mouth. You know, different religions have different takes on projecting the future. But there's something so magical when you start to say what it is you want your life to be and you put a plan together based on that. Something magical happens. And I just want everyone to actually take time for themselves because we don't. We put ourselves last mostly. 
And if we take that time to really prioritize us, it's amazing what will happen. And what I wish for everybody is for them to fulfill their dreams. I think that's a beautiful thing. This is like visualization, right? You know, the board you're supposed to put all your dreams on. This is the financial plan of your dreams is going to be on that visualization board because that's what's going to make that thing happen. It sounds really like you might be thinking, oh, wow, you know, I'm sure I can figure it out. No, you can't because sometimes the nuances of money, you know, are really going to maybe up up in the apple cart. But if you have talked about it and you've planned for it, what you can accomplish is endless. So I think what Deborah is doing is really, really important. And I love the way she frames it. And I just love everything about it because I think it just makes dreams come true. And that's what I want. And that's what she wants for every woman out there. We are both, uh, I think it's similar um, I'm yep, maybe a little are. older than she is, but anyway. Well, we're the same age, I think. We're warriors for women. Yeah, we are, we are warriors for women. And we this is what we spend our free time doing because we just want every woman out there to achieve her best self, her goals, her dreams. We've been in service to others for so, so long. I don't know how we got in this predicament, but we did because that's called history. Um, We've been just caretakers and givers. And I love being that person, but it can also be overwhelming and sap you from what you want to do for self-realization. We all need to self-realize. We'll be better professionals, better friends, better sisters, daughters, mothers, wives, if we want to be wives. We will be better on all those fronts if we can accomplish our dreams and feel fulfilled and be energized by it. And the woman who's going to help you do that is Deborah Shatsky. Deborah, thank you for your time today. You are just make my heart so full with all the things that you've done and the way you framed it. And I love, 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 love that you have an all woman company. Don't hire any men, please. Uh, <laughs> we, we can do that at the Bonson group. Uh, we, <laughs> we're very long in men. Uh, we're a great company and I love it to bits. And, you know, I'm a tough old bird, but my goal is to try to bring more women into our group. And it is difficult because there's just not a lot of them out there wanting to do this job. Not yet, but thank you so much. And um, thank, you. thank you guys for joining me today. I look forward to the next podcast and I uh, wish you all well. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at The Fiscal Feminist or check out the website, fiscalfeminist.com.